Hi everyone, in this video I'm just going to go over your review sheet and um, how to do these questions for your quiz. Okay, so the first question says a bag of M&Ms contains four red, three blue, and two green. So if you add up all those, you would get four plus three plus two, and you get nine. So there are nine in total right now. So you have nine total M&Ms. Okay, they want you to find the probability of choosing a red and a blue. Now. Because we see the word and, that means we're going to multiply. Okay, and what they're saying here is that you're going to do with replacement. This means that you're putting the M&M &M back when you choose it. So I'm going to pick a red. When I pick a red, that means I'm getting 4 out of um, 9 chosen. And then and, so multiply, I pick a blue. So that would be, how many blues are there? 3 out of 9. When you multiply these across, you'd end up getting 12 out of 81, which you can reduce to 4 out of 27, but majority of our probability should be written as a decimal, so I'm going to round this to the nearest thousand. The next one says choosing three reds without replacement, which means we would eat one as we pick it, and it means that we're not going to put one into the bag. So if I chose one red, that means that I would have 4 out of 9, and... I'm choosing another one because they're choosing a red and a red and a red. So this means I'm multiplying three numbers. So since I am going to eat a red, that means I'll only have three reds now in the bag. And also um, the total of the bag would go down by one because I ate from the total. So that would be eight. Then I'm going to eat another red. So that means that I would only have two reds left. And then again, the total will go down again to seven. Multiplying these across, you'd get 24 out of 504, which reduces to 1 over 21 if you'd like to do that. But again, I usually like to write these as decimals. Okay. The next question is about obedience school for dogs, um, comparing small dogs and large dogs, and whether or not they pass the course. So the first one says find the probability of a dog passing the course. So all I care about is passing the course. There's no condition, so it would be just 600 over 1,000. As a decimal, this would be 0.6. Now they want you to find the probability of a dog passing the course given they're a large dog. This is a condition because we see the word given. This means we're only going to choose from the large dogs because that's our condition. There are 200 large dogs that have passed the course out of 450 large dogs in total. So therefore, I'm going to divide these two numbers, and I'll end up getting, um, let's see, 200 divided by 450. I'm not sure if it comes out nicely. It's like, okay, 0 0.44 repeating. So let's just do 0.444. Nearest thousandth is always a good idea. Okay. Then they just ask you, are the events passing the course and being a large dog independent? And they say, explain your reasoning from parts B and C. Well, let's see. Parts B and C are setting me up for independence. Because if you notice our values, which are the first value is uh, 600 over 1,000. And the second value is 200 over 450. If you notice, they're in that placement of the same um, placement in different rows, which means we can use these to prove independence. But these values are not equal, which means that passing the course and being the large dog are not independent. They are dependent of each other, which means that one would probably affect the other. Therefore, probably being having a large dog might be a little bit um, more difficult to train than a smaller dog, which is true if you guys would read up on that. I obviously have been reading up on it with Sunny. So anyways, so this means that the events are dependent because the probability of passing the course is not equal to the probability of passing the course with the condition given a large dog. Um, this is because 0.6 does not equal 0.444. The next question says, sketch a histogram that is, has a normal distribution. A normal distribution looks like a bell curve. Um, a histogram has bar graphs that um, the bars touch. So I'm going to make a, something with a peak in the middle and having symmetrical bars on either side of that peak. And this would be normal because that makes a nice bell curve. Then it says sketch a histogram that has a right 
skewed distribution. So that means that the peak would be more towards the left and the tail of the distribution would be more towards the right and they would create that tail, like the dinosaur's head and here's its tail, if you guys remember from my other video. Okay, sketch a histogram that has a left distribution. So very similar to the right distribution, except the peak would be towards the right and the tail would be towards the left. And again, this is because the tail of the dinosaur is towards the left. Okay, next question says, given the histogram below, describe the shape of the distribution. Well, this distribution looks approximately normal. It has a nice bell curve. So you could say approximately normal. You could say bell curve. You could say mound shaped because it looks like a mound. Um, so those are the key phrases we use. Then they ask you to give an estimate of the mean. Well, the mean looks like it's right here. That's what looks like where the highest peak is. Again, this is an estimate, but it looks like that's about where the X bar is, the mean. Um, it's not exactly 33, because 33 is in between here. So this is actually 33.5. So I'm going to say the mean is about 33.5, because that's where the biggest peak is. Now remember, to estimate the standard deviation, you want to be able to fit three standard deviations on either side of the mean. I usually start with something small like one, two, or three, and that actually makes a lot of sense because if you notice, this is counting um, by twos, so it, it's probably one, two, or three. So if I add, let's start with um, two because it looks like it's counting by twos. So if I add 33.5 plus two, I'd get 35.5. 35.5 would be here. So this would get me one standard deviation. Okay, so if I add 2 to that one, I'd get 37. That would be two standard deviations, 37.5. And adding 2 to that would be 39.5. Um, so that would be three standard deviations. That looks pretty good. It covers most of my data. Um, it doesn't cover this end tail, so maybe I'll try three or um, 2.5, just to see if that was a, a better fit. So let's go small, let's try 2.5, and let's see if we can cover all the data with that. So if I do 33.5 plus 2.5, that would get me 36. This would be my first standard deviation right here. One, okay. If I add 2.5 to that, I would get 38.5, which would be at here, 2. If I add 2.5 to that, I'd get 41, which would be about here. That's not bad. So 2.5 looks like a good one. Um, and let's just test 3, and we'll see which one is the best. I think 2.5 is probably the best, because I think 3 might overshoot it too much. Let's just check. So if I take 33.5 and add 3, I get 36.5. That would be about here. That would be my one standard deviation. Add three to that, I get 39.5, which will be about here. And if I add three to that, which would be 42.5, 40, um, 42.5 would be about over here. So because there's no data over here, I'm going to go with the 2.5 is my standard deviation. Um, so I'm just going to go back to what I had before. Okay, so we're going with 2.5 and then I'm just going to test it on the other side to see if it's a good fit. So I'm going to take 33.5 and I'm going to subtract 2.5 because that's three standard deviations. That'll get me about 31, which will be here. This is negative one standard deviation. Subtract 2.5 from that, give me 28.5, which would be about here, negative two standard deviations, and subtract 2.5 from that would be 26, which would be here. So I hope this video helps you guys with this review sheet, and good luck, and as always, message me with any questions.